2019 update. Um, and, you know, I think they'll get an awful lot of people who will say yes to that because people do like new things. They won't get 100% coverage. They might not even get 50% coverage, but they'll get millions and millions and millions of PCs. And on top of that, I think they could add incentives. For example, if somebody's already a, uh, an, an Office 365 home or personal subscriber, offer to extend their subscription by a month if they agree to install the, the, the April 2019 update. You know, there's ways that they can do it, but the idea that everyone, regardless of their wishes, has to install this thing, I, I just don't think is sustainable. Yeah, that's, that seems like it'd be a valid move because if you got people to opt in to these updates and get things earlier, you would also buy yourself some tolerance, right? Because those type of people would be like, yeah, it didn't go so well. And they're willing yeah, and, and, and you, can add, you can add support options on top of that, you know, to, to say, you know, if you experience any problems, here's the phone number that you call, you know, support professionals are standing by to assist you. That's certainly what they did with the uh with the, the current bug that they're experiencing all of those people were given support numbers to call and and as it is right now if you have any kind of trouble installing a, a windows 10 upgrade you do have free support available to you so there's no reason that they can't have you know both the incentive and the helpline out there to make it appear that you know hey you're being you're helping us we're here to help you yeah the one problem with that is if i have to call support hotline over a weekend i'm killing somebody <laughs> like if, if any tech goes bad off hours yeah i am just living because yeah. you're just taking away personal time. well sure but this is a thing that you opted into at least right. You know, which is different from a thing that they did to you where you really feel twice as angry because you have to call to fix it over the weekend. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't opt in. So I think the other thing they can do like this to kind of create the image that they're being responsive is going back to my point about what about a reliability reset? I mean, some people are going to be against this who work in Windows because they'll be like, oh, this is egg on our face saying we're not reliable and that we have a quality issue. But other people like enterprise customers and business customers and small business customers will say, hey, I love that they're doing this. This is amazing. And I'm really happy that they just took ownership of their issue. They're going to have some, they're going to do something for, you know, one six month period. Maybe, maybe that's one time thing, just like XPSPT was. And then they're going to move on. I think I think it would help them a lot to show that they realize there is something that's not working in this window, Windows as a servicing uh, strategy, and that they were public about the fact that they want to make it right for everybody. That brings me to my my last question here, which is, how many features are enough? Too much? Too little? <laughs> um, I've updated Windows 10 a few times now. And I can't tell you one thing new they threw into it. <laughs> don't even notice. I mean, I guess Cortana does something. I don't know. Um, Cortana who? But generally speaking, I don't know what they've done. Um, so I don't know. How, how, what kind of features should they be getting us? And how many and how often? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if you can give a definitive number and say a hundred or fewer than a hundred. And I agree with you. A lot of these are kind of under the covers type of features where, you know, it's it's like we tweaked where this box is located now, or we've added a fluent design to this or that. So they're not always widely viewed features. The one group of features, though, that I think they should not go away from, and that they're again their business customers really care a lot about, are the security features. You know, it doesn't really matter how many emo We all froze there. <laughs> Mary Jo froze. I'm still here. All right. That's crazy. Okay. Um, so, Ed, what kind of features should we have going on? Well, the uh, the fact that you didn't notice any new features 
is probably, I think, a sign of success because it means that whatever incremental changes they're making in there aren't enough to trigger the whole who moved my cheese reaction. Uh, but I can tell you, there's things like the notifications pane uh, that are dramatically improved over what it was two years ago it, it, through the course of four updates. And those have been little tweaks that are designed to make the notifications pane more useful in programs on the start menu. And, but for people who dig in and actually use those features, they're, you know, there's a clicker less that they have to do. So the fact that they're making incremental improvements like that, I think is, is pretty decent. Mary Jo made a decent point though, I think that we shouldn't lose sight of, which is that features and reliability improvements that happen at the architectural level. So those are, you know, and those can go down to the kinds of changes to windows that, for example, address the heart bleed issue. Uh, or that address, you know, meltdown inspector uh, issues in the Intel CPUs. You don't want those kinds of things being delivered with the monthly updates because they have a real potential to, to mess things up when they're installed as part of an upgrade. But they're also the kind of features that you're not going to notice uh, in in day-to-day -day use, but they're really important. I don't know, I, you know, when I look at the at the list of features each release, each six months, I'm usually impressed with how long the list is, but I'm also impressed by the fact that there aren't too many things in there that seem trivial to me. You know, they, they've done a pretty good job of, of balancing those things out. All right. Uh, Mary Jo, your, your cat hit escape or something, didn't it? Yep, he did. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what just happened. <laughs> Um, so, final word on features before you were rudely cut off by your cat. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, I, I think I think they need to, unless they do this pause again for reliability and quality, when I think they should just put everybody and all hands on that task of fixing the processes and the, and the infrastructure. I think after that, you make sure you have security updates in every release that you do because that's what your business customers really want have manageability updates. You know, some of these other features they've added, like emoticons and things like that, it's like, okay, nice to have, but not really must have. And I think it's important for Microsoft to remember, they may in some ways be competing with iOS and Android, but this is a desktop operating system, not a phone operating system first and foremost. So they need to think about features that matter to people in a work environment on a desktop around productivity and not get all caught up in, you know, how many new this or that do we have compared to iOS. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Microsoft Outlook is often rendered useless because it cannot connect to its Exchange server. Sometimes troubleshooting the issue is as simple as closing Outlook and restarting it. In other instances, troubleshooting is much more challenging, or so it seems. One of the most reliable ways to troubleshoot Outlook is renaming your .ost or rebuilding your .pst file. Fortunately, there's a built-in tool for the rebuilding process and renaming the OST file is quite simple. I'm going to walk you through the steps of renaming and rebuilding those data files. Hopefully, that will resolve your Outlook connectivity issue. Do note, you will have to alter these instructions depending upon which version of Outlook you are using. Rename your .ost file with the following steps. Close Outlook. Open the control panel. Locate the mail icon. In the resulting window, click Data Files. Select your data file from the list and click Open File Location. Locate the data file in question. If the file has the extension .ost, rename the extension to .old. If the file has the extension .pst, do nothing. Close these windows and open Outlook. Rebuild your .pst file with the following steps. Search for scanpst.exe through Windows Explorer. After you locate the file, double-click to run the application. From the resulting window, click Browse. Locate your .pst file. Click Start. Allow the scan to finish. If, after renaming and rebuilding your data file, Outlook is still unable to connect, it's time to call the IT department. 
It could be a DNS issue, an exchange issue, or a number of other possibilities. And on the off chance you've accidentally switched Outlook to offline mode, click on the Send Receive tab, locate the Work Offline button, and click the Offline button. You'd be surprised at how many people make the mistake of switching Outlook to offline mode. It happens. Now that you know about it, you'll never do it again. Right? You have to be updated with the new features because many new features help use and be more productive in daily basis. I think if they combine some parts of the products like for example Power BI to see dashboards and to measure uh, their company, I think it's better to understand and how to leverage the company. I think right now I think uh, Teams, uh, it's a, a new way to collaborate and uh, if we are in just one place and you can add apps and you can do some development inside of Teams and you can have all these in one place. I think uh, leaders, they need the organization to be more involved and to be more close each other because in a world or an, in a big organization we are separately geographically and I think with these kind of tools some travels could uh, not be done because we have tools that reach together in any time. I think the most, thing, most important thing about moving to Microsoft Teams is that it can be gradual. Uh, companies don't have to all of a sudden do, well, it's not a rip and replace because if you're coming from the cloud, but it's something that you can do gradually based on when you're ready and when your users are ready. So Microsoft is making it such that you can keep Skype for business, whether it's on-prem or online, and then as you're ready, you can move to Teams and um, move to the new uh, collaborative environment that it's providing. So it's not an all or nothing, it's migrate at your own pace. I think for moving to Teams, because it is a collaborative type of solution, the best place would be to start with um, groups or divisions that really need that colla uh, collaborative part that Teams provides. So maybe um, a sales department or a marketing department, um, engineering, groups that really do need to collaborate. I think if you start with one group like that and then see how things go um, and then move on from there, that might be the best way to do it. For tech leaders, I think it's going to be a little tricky right now because we don't have all the details. So it's kind of a wait and see as um, Microsoft provides more information. So I think right now it's try to learn as much as you can from Microsoft and try to understand uh, what changes uh, you'll have to make on your side. But I, I think right now it's still a little early because they're not um, they're not quite ready yet. So I, I think hold off and try to get as much information as you can. Hey everybody, this is Brandon Villarolo for Tech Republic, and today we're going to talk about finding and removing duplicate uh, data from an Excel spreadsheet. Start off uh, by selecting any field inside of your spreadsheet. Uh, Excel is smart enough that it'll know to select all the rest of the appropriate cells. Click on Data on the top menu, then over to Filter, and then Advanced. 
and you'll see this window pop up right here. So you can choose to either filter the list in place or copy the data to another location. For a small spreadsheet like this, it's really simple to just copy the table to a new spot on the same uh, sheet and remove duplicate items. So to select copy to, click in that field right there and then drag out to the same size or larger than the data table. So in this case, we're gonna select those blocks there and make sure after that to click unique records only. That way it'll remove the duplicates. And hit okay. There you go. You'll see there we remove the one duplicate and you're all set. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe to our Microsoft Weekly Newsletter for more Excel tips and tricks just like this one. Our men are running, sir. Microsoft has a new CEO. Satya Nadella, the former executive vice president of the company's cloud and enterprise group, has taken the reins. And he has a lot of work to do. In the next two minutes, I'm going to outline three things the new Microsoft CEO should do right now. I'm Bill Detweiler, and this is Tech Republic's Two Minute Drill. Today's Microsoft is a far cry from the simple software company founded by Bill Gates and Paul Allen. It's a global tech conglomerate that offers enterprise software, consumer software, cloud services, unified communications, search, and hardware such as tablets and even a video gaming console. But as we move into the post-PC era, and as competitors such as Apple, oh, Google, and Amazon running, have sir. risen, Microsoft has lost relevancy, and many would say it's direction. And that's what the new CEO needs to bring, direction, and more importantly, vision. Now to do that, he must first and foremost refocus on the enterprise. This is where the company makes most of its money. It's a growing business, and it's where the Microsoft brand still has a little cachet. And this extends beyond software and services. The Surface and Windows Phone could be formidable business devices with enough customers. And that's why the second thing the new CEO should do is buy RIM. Think about it. RIM still has a large and dedicated enterprise customer base who could all be converted to Windows Phone. Now, unfortunately, I don't think this leaves room for a pure consumer device like the Xbox. So the third thing on our list is spinning off the gaming division. The Xbox has never made any real money, and it continues to be a distraction from the more lucrative commercial business. Microsoft just can't rule the enterprise if they're also trying to rule the living room. Well, that's it for this Tech Republic Two Minute Drill. You can find out a lot more information on this topic in the links below. Thanks for watching. There's no question the Azure announcement this does to me was Azure Arc. I think that Microsoft was missing part of the hybrid cloud story, and it's very reflective of where people are today. We find that 76% of respondents that we survey have a hybrid cloud strategy in place. So being able to have that management of on-prem and cloud resources from a common management tool, Azure Arc in that case, I think is a very important step forward for Microsoft. Yeah, I feel like Microsoft uh, woke up this year at Ignite. They kind of had a lot of these capabilities, um, and it's very, historically, they haven't really taken the time to compare themselves to other cloud service providers. This year they did, they kind of dropped the gloves and they said, uh, compared themselves specifically to Google. Um, and I think it's good. I think it's good from a attendee perspective to understand if they may be looking at competing cloud um, services out there, what dif how, how Azure can differentiate between what somebody like Google or AWS does. So most companies we talk to have a multi-cloud uh, strategy in place. 
So it's important that they understand what the differences may be between an Azure, Google, and Amazon. So I think it's nice to see Microsoft uh, call out the competition a little bit in an event like this. Certainly others do so at their events. Multi-cloud's a realistic um, point where people are today, and they've dipped their toes into clouds for various reasons. So somebody may be using Azure based on their Microsoft footprint, they may be using Google for a different cloud service, um, they may be using AWS for all, say, modern apps that they developed there first. I think right now you're seeing people try those different clouds, and it is realistic of where business uh, are today. I think at some point they'll bend, and we already see some of this, where the, the majority of their spending will go to a single cloud, but they'll still have multiple clouds in place. They still have to manage, secure, and operate. So when it comes to moving data back and forth, I think it's an important uh, factor to consider. But it all comes, you know, having most architects I see consider that from the very beginning. Now, mistakes are made where they may have to repatriate or move applications back, and there's a cost of doing so. But they've got to understand from the very beginning there's a cost to moving the data. I kind of look at, you know, data ultimately makes the cloud. It's kind of like water in a river. The river isn't going to flow without the water. The cloud doesn't operate without the data moving back and forth as well. So it's important, I think, from the very beginning, they understand what the cost of moving data back and forth may be. And the idea of the cloud isn't necessarily to move large quantities of data on a frequent basis, um, but they need to understand on the times they need to do so what those costs may be, and they will make decisions based on that cost of movement. Are you interested in learning more about the Microsoft Surface Laptop 3? Well, we've got you covered in one convenient cheat sheet on Tech Republic. So the third version of the Surface Laptop is available in both 13 and a half and 15 inch models. They're available and ready to be shipped out now. The thin, lightweight, mid-range PC is designed to compete with rival devices such as the Apple MacBook Pro and MacBook Air. Now the 13 and a half inch Surface Laptop 3 is powered by a quad core 10th generation One of our units Intel has used all its ammunition, processor, huh? and Microsoft says it's twice as powerful as the chip in the Surface Laptop 2, and three times more powerful than the chip that drives the MacBook Air. Now the 15 inch model has a processor that Microsoft calls the fastest processor for any laptop in its class today. Now the device boasts several new features Microsoft promises all-day battery life on a single charge, which is the same claim that it made for the original Surface Laptop and the Surface Laptop 2. Now, the Laptop 3 is available for consumers and for businesses. And for the price, you're looking at the 13.5-inch model starting at $999, and the 15-inch model will set you back just under $1,200. Again, both models are available and ready to be shipped out. For more details on the new features and what you need to know before buying a Surface Laptop 3, check out our cheat sheet on Hyperpublic. Interested in learning more about Windows 10 Power Toys? Well, we've got you covered on Hyperpublic and a convenient cheat sheet. So we know there will always be users looking for a faster, better way to do things, no matter how many features Microsoft crams into its Windows 10 operating system. Well, a set of slightly unusual free Windows tools have been a part of the Windows operating system landscape since Windows 95, but their availability has been noticeably absent for Windows 10. One of our units has used all its ammunition, sir. Huh? Microsoft released the first of two power toys for Windows 10, accompanied by a promise of more releases in the near future. Now, for the most part, power toys allow users to more easily make tweaks to the look and feel of Windows without a deep dive into configuration screens or the dreaded and dangerous edit of the Windows registry file. So if you're ready to tidy up your desktop, check out our cheat sheet for all you need to know about Windows 10 Power Toys. Microsoft rolled out Windows 10 version 1809 this week, and it's been a total disaster. We've had issues of quality, we've had issues, just issue after issue after issue. I'm here with Ed Bott and Mary Jo Foley to talk about fixing this mess and what we should do. Ed, what do you see as the big issues here? Well, there's, there's really two of them. One is the question of overall quality and the fact that a bug snuck into the product that deleted users' files is, that's the most severe category of bug that you can possibly get. And the fact that it made it past testing, even after it had been reported several times, 
uh, in the feedback hub to Microsoft is a, a real black eye on Microsoft. And the fact that they had to pull the update just days after releasing it is frankly unprecedented. So, you know, part of the problem that we need to discuss is do they have a quality problem with the way that they're releasing software? But I think the other issue that fits in there is that even if they do everything perfectly, even if they do all the testing and read all the bug reports and respond to them properly, is it, uh, is it acceptable to their customers, to the people who are using Windows 10, especially in homes and small businesses, to be forced to do a full upgrade every six months? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, I just kind of wonder, I, I don't know if they, I don't think they're used to moving at this cadence overall. Um, and I also think Agile's hard. And it also, you have to, you know, take a few quality shots. Um, Mary Jo, how do you, what do you, what's your take on the quality issue and how do you fix it? You know, I think they, even if they don't have a giant quality issue, you know, the question is how many people were actually affected by this known folder redirect bug? I think they said something like one one hundredth of one percent. Regardless of that though, the, it's, a, it's about the optics to me. So even if you weren't affected, even if you didn't even start rolling this update out to your customers yet as, an, as a large IT shop, you heard about this. And it's gotta be in the back of your mind, um, you know, is Microsoft having a quality issue? Do they know what they're doing? in terms of reliability, is this sustainable? So I, I actually wrote um, a proposal this week on my blog saying, maybe they should do what they did back with XPSP2 and have a reset. You know, back in those days, it was a security reset. Maybe now they need a quality reset. And by a reset, you mean what exactly? I would say at least one of these two annual feature updates that they're doing an, uh, every year, should perhaps be just about fit, finish, and fixing the underlying infrastructure and the processes, instead of always just feature, feature, feature. I think enterprises would be really happy about that if you said, hey, you know what? Our spring update is our new feature update. Our fall update is our quality update where we just make sure everything works inside the org and inside the product. So, so Ed, we know like they got the six month idea from every other cloud vendor, right? I mean, whether it's, as, no, as soon as the cloud came toi. around, somehow we got on to six month cadence. Cadence, it's spring, it's fall, you go. Um, is six month updates, is that too much, too little? Well, from a development point of view, it actually works pretty well. Uh, and I think surprisingly the quality of these of these uh, spring and fall releases has been generally about as good as Microsoft's ever done with any kind of uh, with any kind of software. The uh, it is uh, it is difficult to compare it to their more mainstream operating system competitors. Android is on an annual cadence. iOS is on an annual cadence. Mac OS is on an annual is on an annual cadence. And more importantly, in all three of those cases, the updates are optional. You see a new update come out, you can sit and you can watch it for months before it's uh, before you're forced to release it. What Microsoft has done that I think is probably the problem here is that they're forcing it onto machines, especially people in using Windows 10 Home who don't have any management controls over it, or people in small businesses who might have Windows 10 Pro or maybe even have Windows 10 Enterprise, but don't really understand how the management tools work. So I'm not opposed to the idea of pushing out new builds every six months, but maybe as I wrote in an article yesterday, uh, maybe the thing to do is to follow the same sort of, of release schedule that Ubuntu Linux does, where they have builds that come out every six months, but most of those are categorized as interim releases and they're optional updates for people. The long-term releases could be every year or maybe even every two years where you're forced to, uh, to upgrade. That might work better than this, this forced march of every six months. 
Yeah, I mean, the forced issue is interesting because, like, Apple, I feel like they forced me to upgrade. Uh, Android, you can just leave whatever's there there for almost ever. Um, so, Mary Jo, how do you think they should do this better? Yeah, you know, um, I think the I, I like the idea that Ed proposed of having home users have an optional uh, have have a choice basically you know do i want both updates do i just want one a year but i don't think microsoft will do that and the reason i don't think they will is they are using home users as almost like a fourth ring in their development process so when they release a new test uh, when they release a final build of a windows 10 feature update after it's gone through all the insider rings it then goes to home users and they're like the guinea pigs. They're like the next ring, right? And so I don't think Microsoft wants to do away with that. I think they want them to be forced to take it so they can kind of